I'd, I'd like to start out by emphasizing uh, some of the things that we could do that are very positive, that are going to make a big difference. <laughs> First of all, um, I talked to, I uh, told you, Dr. Raul about a year ago when I was so depressed about what was going on. I mean, really, I sleepless nights and so on. It's been better since my conversation with Dr. Raul. Do you remember what you told me as far as how I should change my attitude? Hmm. I don't recall, but you know, usually what I say is that the way I work is that I assume that there is a larger force at play and I'm just an actor. So I do my best and leave the rest for that larger force to take care of. So this is why I really don't talk about hope. I talk about faith because hope comes from a position of fear. Hope comes, hope comes from knowing that you're doing something, you know, that things are going bad and we are hoping that it will get better. But as faith says, I know that this is, needs to be changed and I'm going to change that and I'm going to let love take care of it. So it comes from a position of love. Um, so to me, you know, everything changed when my granddaughter was born. Until then, I was also depressed. I used to think, my God, how can I change this? Who am I to change it? It's so big and so huge. And, you know, what am I doing as one person? Uh, but as I saw that animals, Jesus live and the planet thrives. And I thought, you know, why is it that we are the only species that doesn't do that? And then when my granddaughter was born, you know, I went to see her when she was a month old. And I held her in my arms and she looked up at me and she smiled. And with that smile, she convinced me instantly that she belongs exactly as she is. And that we all must belong exactly as we are. And that we are not telling the right stories. Because it's through stories that human beings coordinate our actions among millions and billions of us. Through stories, through telling stories and through playing games. Okay. And so I realized we were not telling the right story. We should tell a story in which we do belong exactly as we are. And as a process of that, we are going to transform ourselves because we know how fast we can change. We have done this so many times. You know, we've changed on a dime. So uh, knowing that, I, I said, okay, now I to, it's, this is my homework. I need to go figure out what is this new story. And so that's how I came up with the story of the thermostat species, you know, the climate regulator species. That's who we are. We are the climate regulators of the planet. And we are here to serve the animals, not to eat them. <laughs> we are here to take care of them and to serve them because they depend on us to maintain the climate for them so that the earth never has to go back to another ice age ever again. So when I realized that, you know, we always had this purpose right in front of our faces, staring at us, because we know that we are changing our climate. You know, once we know that, we realize we have to, we, are the, we have the responsibility to maintain it for all life. Um, so then, you know, then that clicked. And once that clicked, I, you know, I was just on, on automatic pilot, right? going and pushing this, telling people, here is this new story, here is this new game we should be playing, because the old game is not serving us anymore. You know, it's all about growth. That's what the old game is. And so we need to design a new game that's about sufficiency, that's about making sure that every one of us is thriving. You know, as an engineer, I look at the food system and I'm saying, any engineer, any incompetent engineer could do a better job than that. It's such a shambles, right? It's not designed to take care of us. It's designed for corporations to make money of our diseases. So, and we can definitely do a better job than that. So this is why I focused on the food system because it's, to me, it is a lever that would change the whole way of thinking, the whole way of relating to the planet. Uh, it's, uh, it's a fundamental change that needs to happen. So, what kind of uh, what kind of questions have we brought up in our audience, Heather? Well, I just um, had one come in. Okay, um, it's mentioned that we are currently only ten to twenty percent environmentally efficient. How long will it take to get closer to a hundred percent if we change our diets to a vegan diet? Do you have some thoughts on that, Jim? 
Uh, yes, I, I think uh, as I've stated before and you have stated, the diet is the only thing, only major thing that we can do quickly and efficiently and it can buy us some time to get around to those other things. Uh, there's a, but, but it, by changing the diet, we, we eliminate the number one cause of climate change if, if everyone in the world did that. And everyone in the world, in the developed world, I should say, has the opportunity to do that because not only, not, not only will they get healthier, but they'll save money at the same time. Most people think eating vegan is, is more expensive. And John, you know that rice and beans don't cost nearly as much per calorie as, as sirloin. So it's an easy, st easy step to take and it, and it enables us to have hope that we're going to have time to get around to those other things. Uh, by the way, that little video is on YouTube and you can, I gave it a unique name so it's easy to find if you go to YouTube and hit the search button and put in donkeys and spaceships, it'll come right up. So you can share it with your friends and I would welcome uh, Zoom calls, personal calls with you and your friends, anybody that's listening, because my mission in life is to, is to share a vision of what is possible and try to do my best to help us get there. I'm, I'm not a technical person. I can't design those systems, but I can, I can read what Elon Musk says. I can see that hyperloops can replace airplanes. We don't, we don't need automobiles if we're we, we can get, forget electric automobiles. We don't need automobiles if we're in a system that's designed to move about without needing an automobile. So a lot, a lot of things to think about. I, I certainly don't think I have all the answers. I have a lot of the questions and I also have a lot of data from scientists that I respect and admire. But I, as I said in the video, I, I'm, I have four reasons for being more optimistic than they are. And uh, one is that only two of those 11 scientists really get it about food, T. T Colin Campbell and Ro Robert Goodland, who is deceased. Uh, the second is artificial intelligence. And, and if we can unleash our artificial intelligence on working on this, the power of systemic change, number three, is recognizing that no matter what individuals all over the world do, we cannot change our systems without sweeping collaboration with powerful governments and leaders around the world. And finally, leadership. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't know if you know the name uh, of... Uh, Pardon? I'll get it. Right. So, yeah, go ahead. Someone spoke up there. Well, I, I was just, you know, what you had to say, I was reflecting upon one of the first books that I read about the climate. It was about The Overheated Planet by Thomas Friedman. And what he said was that uh, it would cost more than the Manhattan Project, which was the development of the, uh, what was that? the development of the atomic bomb or uh, World War II, the man let's see, that was the Manhattan Project. The world is flat. The world is flat. Anyway, he, he also said back about 15 years ago that it would be far too expensive for us to deal with climate change. And that was, you know, 15, 20 years ago when far too expenses made it meant a trillion dollars. Yeah. Well, you know, what it's cost us and costs us almost every day is close to that considering the environmental destruction that we're going through right now. Hot, flat, and crowded. Hot, flat, and crowded is the name of the book okay. by Thomas Friedman. But you know what? I and mean, the point I wanted to make is he did not consider diet as a factor. This, this, is, this is the whole thing that I would like you folks to think about is those who are making these pessimistic predictions, they don't consider that we can change our diet and the potent effect of dietary change will be. We, we can't change. And once you put that factor back in, then it becomes hopeful, it becomes realistic. That's where the power is. It's an individual change that we can make. So all of those who are, are predicting doom and gloom Oh, they're probably right unless we take action that is uh, under our, our immediate control, which is the food. Right. Right. You know, I mean, that, that's one of the things I've noticed about Western science is that, I mean, science tends to be um, very good and very precise at uh, going to the frontiers of the material world, but it tends to be very poor at 
looking within and understanding the realities of within. This is why it took scientists until 2012 to finally figure out that animals have consciousness. You know, it's like, excuse me, we knew this thousands of years ago. Why didn't you ask us, right? <laughs> so uh, it is, uh, this is, and I think this is part of the block that uh, Jim talks about the block. He calls it, I don't know, um, was it the protein block? What do you call it, Jim? The SOS memos, saving our species. No, no, you talk oh, about the, the protein yeah. myth, the protein myth. No, the protein myth you talk about, there is this block that people have about looking uh, at food, right? And you had a term for that, I remember. Well, I can address that. It, uh, people believe protein is the most important nutrient right. for human health, right? Everywhere you go. In fact, if you change your diet, you become a vegetarian or worse yet a vegan. First thing your friends are going to ask is where do you get your protein? Well, you know, I, I know this subject very well. And what I would tell you is there's never been a case of dietary protein deficiency ever described. The, the need of the human being for protein is so low that it wasn't even considered by Mikhail Hinhiti when he designed the diet for the Danes back during World War II or World War I. You know, any scientist who understands nutrition and the research behind good nutrition knows that protein is not a factor that we should ever consider in choosing the right kind of diet. And by choosing protein, we're choosing meat. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're, and we're choosing eggs and we're choosing dairy, right? That's how they sell these animal products is by unique positioning. Meaning that yes, these foods have a lot of protein in them, but they don't bother to tell you there's no such thing as protein deficiency. So, you know, I, I am very well aware of that block. And when people go for more protein, obviously they go for more of the animal foods that are destroying the planet, but they also go for some of the most toxic elements affecting their own personal health. These high protein diets damage the bones, the kidneys, the liver. They cause you to age faster by increasing your IGF-1 levels. So protein is the last thing you ought to focus on. And hopefully that was the point you were trying to get with, with, uh, with Jim's presentation. Mm -hmm. I, I would like to ask a question, and I, I want to provide one of the answers that I think is most important. Why is it that people like Al Gore and even Greta Thunberg and certainly Thomas Friedman, wh why is it, no, not, not Greta Thunberg, so let me take her out of the equation, but Al Gore and uh, Thomas Friedman, probably uh, most of the members of the Lancet Commission, why do they ignore this subject when it's so important? Well, let me tell you the answer. They can't see beyond their own dinner plates. You know, and they're confused. They say, well, let's see. The research on one hand shows that I'm destroying my health and the planet by eating these rich food. But on the other hand, you have a fork and spoon that's shoveling these very foods in your mouth and you get confused. You know, it's, uh, we've, got to, we've got to change people's personal diets, just like you know, some of the folks that we, that we talked about. I would guess if, Jim, you went back through the discussions of those who are optimistic about the environment, that they've made significant dietary changes themselves. And so they can see beyond their own dinner plate. Tell me some other reasons that people have this blind spot. Experts have this blind spot. Government officials, dietitians, medical doctors, scientists even. I think they're confused. They, what they read doesn't fit with what they're doing. We also have a system that discourages this from being discussed. And if you discuss it, you lose your position in the system. You get demoted. You don't get enough airtime. You get, you know, so you, you're not, you no longer... Um, you no longer have the visibility within the system. So, I mean, you have a name because you got visibility in the system, right? So people want to cling to that and they, they don't want to give that up. And they know that when they talk about this, they're gonna get demoted. So I think that's fundamentally how the system maintains itself. So as Jim said, you know, sometimes you cannot fix a system. You really have to start over. Like when I was uh, asked to work on, um, making this internet robust, 
you know i was i was looking at the cable and and understanding that the standard that we had was all entirely analog based and you cannot fix it i mean you cannot make it go any faster by using the same technology so i said we need to start over and do it all with digital signal processing and they all told me i was crazy <laughs> they laughed at me they said you, you know you're talking greek and latin to us we don't even understand what you're talking about but they let me play so within 6 months they realized that i was serious because there were enough people talking to me and working with me saying yeah you are right it can be done it can be done and my company got acquired and it became part of intel you know and then intel put it on the motherboard and the rest is history i mean we are talking on zoom because of that because it's it's a digital signal processing methodology that we used that made it run 10 times faster and more robust and i think we have the same kind of system shift in front of us this is what gives me hope because i've done it before you know i've done it before it gives me you know faith that this can be done right this this is uh, imi- imminent it's going to happen there can you bring up some thoughts from our uh, our, our chat board sure uh, interest people have questions they have we got a few um, more minutes to share jim This is a question for Jim. I mean, it could be out for all of you. Getting people to socially distance and wear masks is essentially impossible. How are they going to react when they get their burger burger taken away? What's <laughs> the solution? <laughs> well, uh, in in our book, we describe uh, as a my first attempt at, at describing uh, a sustainable civ- civilization was was uh, occurred in a conversation I had with a gentleman. Uh, actually, the the gentleman who who became my co-author, and he was the person who introduced Greta Thunberg to the world stage. And I was describing uh, I I learned about Hyperloop trains, and I was describing you know a a system running from from Atlanta to Los Angeles, and I called it Gratola, Green Region Atlanta to Los Angeles, and it was ten miles wide, and and I just kind of talked that through. and uh as i as i wrote about it for another year i said well you know we don't we we can't build that thing from atlanta to los angeles because it it it'd be hotter there than it'll be in next to canada so we need to go back and and, and readjust that but uh in and and i presented that in the in the in the talk today i call that one the great big northern it goes from boston to seattle so how does that how does that happen well you it happens one segment at a time let's say one 10 mile segment one 150 mile segment whatever and the first segment that opens there be a new new form of government i call it the american green region authority and they will call the shots there and and they will invite people to populate that first segment and only people that want to be there will go there and there were only big green lifestyle options there everything from transportation to clothing the economy uh the jobs the housing everything is 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 all about uh sustainability and to some people it'd be like dying and going to heaven to the wealthy people today it wouldn't be because they would be it would seem more like communism to them but let's remember only people who want to be there will go there and will be a and they will have to agree to all of the terms of the American Green Region Authority one would which would be uh, having one child per per family and there's some things that there were some elements that has to be there in order to control population and other things and the, but the, some of these things people everybody won't like it first well everybody do, is not going to like starving to death at first either if we have a system that we can envision that there be more things about the new system that we like then then i think we have a chance to build that system populate it completely and never force anybody to move there because they know when they go there there's not going to be any meat dairy egg or fish there number one there's not going to be uh un uncontrolled uh, consumerism uh, there's not going to be an economy based on consuming stuff And so I came up uh, in the book with something called uh, the BHI it's kind of like a credit score a credit score for every individual and every nation but it's not a credit score it's called a BHI behavior uh 
Biospheric Health Index. So everybody has a biospheric health index and they get their, their compensation from the American Green Region Authority. Maybe it comes in a, an electronic form in their wristwatch. You know, that's certainly possible these days. And depending on their life and what they do in their life, they have a higher biospheric health index score and the highest scores get the, get the most luxuries in terms of housing, food, entertainment, travel, that sort of thing. Everything is based on green. Everything has got to be greener. So these are just, just thoughts that, that rattle around in my head, but I know, and I can't describe what it's gonna look like or how long it would take, but I know that we have to have a, a, a scorekeeping system, an economy, that is not based on the never ending consumption of stuff in a world of finite resources. And we have to reward people that are helping to build. As Jim, I took it right out of James Lovelock's definition of the definition of if the earth improves because of our presence, then we will flourish. If it does not, we will perish. And if you think about that, that vision of the, of the garbage truck, and you think about our reckless lifestyles, you know, I may have been, been too, uh, too generous in terms of how, what percent we're living, uh, you know, I'll go back to the, how green is green enough? Um, you know, and I said, maybe we're living 10 to 20% as green as we need to be. Maybe the right number is two to 5%. We are nowhere close to living green enough to survive on this planet. And we're adding another four, four million people a, a week. You know, it's, it's just a, an unsustainable situation, but nobody in leadership is talking about it anywhere in the world. And, and I looked at that article of the New York Times last week about the, the new administration is going to do a superior job of, of fighting climate change. Well, they didn't even mention the food in a 2000 word article about it in the New York Times, not one word. So, you know, it, it, it is, it's a frustrating situation, but uh, I think what you're doing, John, and, and taking the lead here with, with getting the word out there and providing it free to the public is, is a great step in the right direction. And I appreciate being, being included today. And that, re that also requires, puts an obligation on all of you to, to go on and share with others. You know, we, we can't do it alone, but uh, you can be a big influence uh, on, on your friends and relatives. And yeah, now, I, is the, now is the time. I do want to mention that this entire event is being recorded and will be on our YouTube channel tomorrow. So please share. So Jim, while I'm listening to you, I'm thinking, and I know other people are thinking, you know, this is so radical. I mean, the whole world's not gonna go, go vegan. So what about what they always say about diet? What about moderation? What if we all just do a little bit less? Will that make a difference? Well, I think, as I said earlier, it might, it might buy us some time to get around to fixing things. But uh, I, I keep going back to the question on that one slide is how green is green enough? for us to survive. And if you listen to the scientists and, and read the data, uh, we are nowhere close. I mean, like, like I said, it may be 2%, maybe it's a high of, of 20% as efficient as we need to be, but the rules have to change. We can't have an economy that's based on maximizing the consumption of stuff. Just look at the, the vulgar shopping that goes on in this world. Just Gift giving, I mean, it's a tradition. We can give gifts without giving physical things that have to be manufactured. And, and we can give, write a poem for somebody, could be a gift, uh, give them a video, whatever. There's so many things that we can do to, to live um, much more sustainably, but we can't as individuals change the entire system. And for that, we need a global conversation that attracts the attention of the likes of those 10 billionaires in the video. Uh, I know two of those billionaires, Jim Cameron and Ralph Lauren. I worked for Ralph Lauren for, for a number of years as a division president in one of his divisions. Uh, I, I have no reason to think he's even thinking about this, but I, I'm surprised that people like Elon Musk and Bezos and Gates don't talk more about the food. 
and I keep coming back to the fact that it's the protein myth. They, they believe that we need to eat animal protein to be healthy. The smartest people in the world believe that. I believe most college professors believe that. I believe most, most people on the science, the scientists in my chart there, the, the 11 sciences, I think most of them think it, except for Goodland and, and Campbell on that, on that list. Dr. Peter Wadhams, who's become a friend of mine, he's on that list. He's a Arctic scientist. And he said, uh, he said he is now eating better since he got to know me. So I've referred him to John McDougall and people that can help him with improving his diet. I just, what I say to folks is, uh, go ahead, Salish. Now, I just remembered, uh, uh, Jim, the term that you were using was locked brain syndrome. Oh, locked brain, LBS, yeah. Brain. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Okay. Go ahead, John. Well, I was going to say, you know, read the science. I mean, the science is crystal clear as far as protein is concerned. And we really have to get over that myth because that, that is paralyzing people. Or if you don't want to take the trouble to read the science, just think about how many cases of protein deficiency you've seen or amino acid deficiency you've seen. The answer is none. Yet this is the major worry people have about nutrition is protein. But you've never seen a case of protein deficiency. It's never existed. <laughs> Amazing how people can get fooled. Well, power of advertising. The other long brain syndrome that I see happening that's causing us to, to get stuck in the system is the idea that happiness is outside of us. Okay, that we have to go grab things from outside and, and you know, enjoy things and only then will you get happy. And this is something that we addressed thousands of years ago you know, in, uh, in our culture that happiness is not outside, it's within you, it's always there. It's always there for you to tap into. And switching our system to reflect that is very important because right now our system thinks that pursuit of happiness is the pursuit of material wealth. Okay? So we've equated the two and we are just running after like crazy. And you'll see that even the wealthiest people have in taking, are taking antidepressants or anti-anxiety medications. In fact, half of Americans are on antidepressants or anti-anxiety medications on a regular basis. And you know, this is supposed to be the wealthiest country in the world. So we clearly are not doing a good job on the pursuit of happiness. You know, we're going backwards. So that's, I think, one of the other locked brain syndromes we need to address, besides the protein myth. Yes. Or the idea that starches make you fat. <laughs> and, and faces the observation that around the world and throughout history, all populations of people who've lived on starch-based diets, i.e. Asians, the Aztecs and the Mayans, the Incas, uh, the Middle East was once known as the breadbasket of the world. All these people who lived on starch-based diets, there was no obesity, no overweight problems. You know, and, and it's not that they exercised heavily like you might be thinking right now. I mean, we're talking about teachers and shop clerks and, and religious ministers. They, you know, they don't do any hard physical activity, yet there are no overweight people in these societies that live on the right kind of diet, which is the traditional diet of human beings. Again, we're not talking about a new invention. We're talking about the way that people have eaten for eons. You know, billions of people. In fact, you know, I, I once said that, uh, uh, that uh, of the people who walk planet Earth, 99% uh, of them lived on a starch-based diet. Uh, you know, it's, it's far greater than that. I want to I want to respond to something uh, that uh, Salesh just said about the theory of happiness. Mm -hmm. um, there was a book that I read long ago called Flow, and it's all about the theory of happiness. And I, I want to tell this little anecdote about uh, about that topic with Ralph Lauren, who I was working for at the time. And Ralph had had uh, set up a luncheon for all of the top executives, about twenty five of us, to come out to his new estate, newly remodeled estate that, that was about 50, $60 million worth of improvements. It was the most beautiful place I had ever been. And I arrived first by accident because instead of going home, I, I was flying in, instead of going home to get changed, I drove on out there and I, 
embarrassed myself by being the first to arrive and, and was announced anyway. When Ralph rushed out to greet me, it was just me and Ralph. And, and I was apologizing for showing up early. He said, oh, no, come on in. I want to show you around. So here is Ralph Lauren giving me a personal tour of the most beautiful mansion I had ever seen. And it was just breathtaking. And he was pointing out details. I was in his closet, in his bedroom, in the kitchen, in the lounges. And, and it was just it was just amazing. And then all of a sudden, I, he just sort of, sort of adopted this uh, sort of forlorn look in his face. And he says, Jim, I've always dreamed. I, I grew up poor in the Bronx. I've always dreamed of having a place like this. And with a sad look on his face, he said, now that I've got it, I don't know what to do with it. <laughs> It was too big to, to, to live in and maintain. It was a place built to, to entertain hundreds of people, grand <laughs> grounds and all of these things. But here's one of the richest people in the world, most privileged, uh, ha could have anything he wanted. He's got the Gulf Stream jets and everything else. And so what he always wanted in his life was a place to live like that. And now that he's got it, I think Henry David Thoreau was much happier in his one room up in Massachusetts. Or New it just goes back to the saying that money never buys happiness. I've known a lot of wealthy people too, Jim. Let me finish and, that. Uh, uh, one, one more thought. So, so when I heard Ralph say that, I said, Ralph, uh, having hear you say that reminds me of a book that I just read. And I told him about flow. It's about the theory of happiness. He, and he looked at me and he, almost shouted at me, I want that book. And he was dead serious. I want that book. Like he desperately wanted to know how to be happy. And so I called my secretary on the way home and said, go get that book and get it to Ralph's office by, by tomorrow when he gets to work. So he had it the next day, wrote me a nice thank you note. Uh, but he has, he has not, he and his team haven't really taken my calls when it comes to helping to start the conversation about food and about all of the other sustainability issues we have, like buying clothes all the time. And that's the business he's in is fashion. So you have to buy something new every, every few months. So the whole system has to change. Right. And uh, I think we can be happier living so simple a, lives. A question, that's totally a question came into the Q and A about um, our new administration coming in January 20th and it's much more climate friendly. And how can we best reach out to them to try to affect real change? Clearly we need to make our own changes, but let's also share our beliefs and what we need to be doing. How can we do that? You can send them to uh, YouTube, donkeys and spaceships. And we'll, we'll talk about that. Uh, there's a one slide in there about the, the New York Times uh, article about the, the new administration is doing a superior job of fighting climate change, but they're not even looking at the food. Not didn't even mention the food. It wasn't mentioned in any of the articles. And so I agree with John wholeheartedly. If, if we don't get the food right, it doesn't matter what else we do because over half of greenhouse gas emissions are caused by eating animal-based foods. Yeah, my calculations are is 87%. I and I know, a minimum of 51, according to Goodland, and yours is 87. Right, 87% is from the food. You know, uh, fundamentally, the flow is actually a rediscovery of yoga. It, it's basically the eight steps he talks about in flow is what the eight steps of yoga, literally. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's us coming back to the wisdom that we always had. Like John was pointing out, that this is the kind of food we have always been eating. It's not something new, right? We just got sidetracked into this industrial age and we did all these things. And in the process, we created all the tools and technologies we need to become the true climate regulators of the planet. So nothing in nature is wasted. You know, nothing in nature is, I mean, nature is such a beautiful, perfect system design. She's just using us. Mother Earth has been using us. So that's what I tell people that, you know, we don't even realize we are being used. And so now she is slapping us around saying, wake up and, you know, and do it right. Go back to what you knew. So this is nothing new, you know, we've always known this.
Well, I, I would uh, I would say that we need to start as far as governmental interaction by telling the truth. Mm. We need to have another dietary commission which looks at the human needs, human nutritional needs, and come out and tell people that we're sick for a reason. It's not a mystery. Of course, we'll offend the meat and dairy industry who are, are, are big lobbyists who uh, who bend the message towards their particular companies and profits. But we've got to put uh, the truth over profits. And we could do things like uh, do public service announcements and tell people what the human being needs. I have challenged people with it, with the fact that it is your obligation to know what the human being eats. Your children depend upon that education. Your spouse does. Your neighbors do. When you 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 as a you know as a curious person need to be able to answer the question: What do people eat? It's just like if you were a horse farmer and you asked what horses eat, everybody who is a rancher who raises horses know exactly what they're supposed to eat. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to people, we have messages that are influenced so much from industry and focused on making them more money that the truth is, is mixed up, it's confused, it's the opposite of what is reality. And uh, you know, I, I would, if I was in charge, and by the way, I am still looking forward to being appointed Surgeon General. <laughs> A reign that I'll hold for 24 hours until I get it assassinated. You know, if I was in charge, I would I would uh, make it uh, required that in all of our elementary schools, all of our colleges, that we have basic courses on what a human being eats. But what is more more important for uh, students than to know what a, what a person eats to have the truth, or when they go into a profession like nursing? or science to have the foundation of what does a human being eat? We know what cats eat. We know what snakes eat, but we don't know what people eat. People eat like cats and dogs. People eat foods that you wouldn't feed to your animals. If you fed the cheesecakes and the ice creams to your animals, somebody from the Humane Society or Farm Animal Reform Movement would come and arrest you. So everybody ought to know what a human being is supposed to eat. And if you don't believe us, you still have the obligation to go out and find out what people eat so you can share that with those who are closest to you. This is fundamental knowledge. So I would make education a, a beginning, a start. I would also stop rewarding the food industries with subsidies, like we're going to stop subsidizing the fossil fuel industries. And hopefully we stop subsidizing the back tobacco and alcohol industries. I, we need to put the food industry at a financial advantage uh, so that they don't win, a financial disadvantage so they don't win. And the government can do that. Uh, the government is designed to protect us from foreign and domestic threats. Just like IBM or Apple is not going to put together an army to defend us from foreign countries, foreign threats. The government has to do that. It's the obligation of the government to defend us from foreign threats. Well, the government's job is also to, to defend us from the domestic threats, like those from the dairy industry and the meat industry and the processed food industry. That's their job. So I, I would ask them to do their job. Mm -hmm. I, I think, you know, I don't want to talk politics, but, you know, things are going to change. We've seen, we've seen one side of the coin, and, and a lot of us haven't been happy with what we've seen. I have to say we've kind of started from the bottom and the only way to go is up. And that's, that's why COVID-19 showed us the possibilities of change. We can, I mean, in, in a matter of hours, the whole economy, the whole society, our whole interactions change because of COVID-19. Well, we could do the same thing if we were educated as to the real threat. I mean, the threat that we will not be able to change in a few years. And that's planetary destruction. And food is a good place to start. Hey, if you're involved in the fossil fuel industry and fighting that battle, I encourage you to do it. It's not that these things aren't important. You know, I think you should all be out there. I know Jim is not in favor of electric cars, but I think you should all be out there promoting electric cars and solar power. You know, whatever is clean energy. But hey, 
Most of us can't do that, but all of us can do something about the food on our own dinner plate and the food on the plates of the people closest to us. And maybe some of you are influential enough because you're writers or television show producers or whatever your talents are to influence in a bigger way. And some, one, of, one of our guests this afternoon uh, actually is in the documentary business and I'll ask him about the influences that he's made that have really made some powerful changes in our society already by the talents he has as a television producer making documentaries. So make sure you stay tuned for this afternoon's session because we've got some very interesting things to talk about. Heather, there must be some other questions people have. So uh, let's see, uh, my 11 year old grandson is worried about climate change. Does anyone have suggestions for good reading materials for this age group or even videos to watch? You know, kids are concerned about the climate. My boys learn about this in school. They know that we're not going down a good path. They don't learn about food, um, but you know, we need to educate our children as well. So what would you recommend that they read or watch? Well, before we get an answer to that, I, I want to recall one of the graduation ceremonies that we all went to uh, for the eighth grade class at uh, Jason's school. And this young boy, he must have been, what, were you in eighth grade? You're what, 14 years old. He, he, was, uh, he was a farmer. He came from a farmer family. And he realized himself, he realized the, the uh, harmful effects that animals were having on the environment. And one of the questions he asked this whole group of very successful people that, are, that belong to this private school, he asked, how many of you are vegan? Because mm -hmm. you should be. So even at that young age as an eighth grader, he do. I have to tell you that Heather, Mary and I were some of the few hands that stood up in that audience of several hundred people. So what kind of things would you suggest that people watch or read? Do you have anybody have any thoughts? I think uh, Greta Thunberg has, uh, Greta Thunberg has really made uh, the public aware. Uh, you know, the children look at this issue and uh, they say we have to make changes because we have to, we have, to uh, have a future. Mm -hmm. But older people like me in our age group, when she talks like that, we say, yeah, but you're going to take all our comfort away. And so we resist. But, uh, you know, we all got to get together in all age groups and work together for a common theme. We need to keep the planet well, and uh, we need to make sure we take care of the elderly, too. See, when Jim said about that uh, our uh, economy is 10% efficient, or 10 to 20% efficient right now, uh, it, I remember reading uh, Donella Meadows' book, The Limits to Growth, and she had estimated it was 0.5% efficient. She's probably <laughs> meeting our true needs. <laughs> meeting our true needs, you know? Probably. She's probably closer to the truth. I know she's a system specialist and she has been looking at this closely. So the, so the thing we need to uh, tell people is that when we fix this, you are actually going to have more comforts, not less than what you have now. And you will actually be happier. Okay, so that's the, uh, that's the transformation. It's just like going from analog to digital, right? We just improved it and it went much better. I think we're gonna do exactly the same thing with this. Because if you look at every, every one of our systems, they are so inefficient. I mean, we are extracting six times as much food as we eat, as we need. And then 1 billion people are going hungry, okay? I mean, are we that stupid? We don't know how to send the food around so that everyone gets enough to eat. Of course, we know how to do that. It's just, it's not being optimized for that. It's optimized to make sure that someone gets the most exotic food he wants, right? Because that's how money talks. Mm -hmm. The, the money system, the money game that we have created, the rules of the game are set up in such a way that we are not able to, to do the things that we need to do when we play that game. So the people with money dis determine what kind of truth can be told. So that we have all this selective uh, revealing of the truth that happens. And it really confuses people. 
So we need a different game. We need a different way of organizing ourselves. And as Jim pointed out, I mean, it, it, you know, you have to have a biosphere health index, but in addition, you need to have all of these indices for each of the planetary boundaries. We need to make sure that we are within the planetary boundaries for CO2, for land use, for water use, for every one of those boundaries that we have. We know we cannot go beyond a certain limit. So this entire donut economics field that's come out now is showing us the way of how to organize ourselves so that no one has to fall within the hole of the donut and, and, and we stay within the boundaries of the donut. And that can only be done in a vegan economy. Okay, that can only be done in a vegan world because when you have a hole in the donut, there is no one who wants to go slaughter animals for a living. No one will want to do that. So well, this is one of the most obvious win-win situations. Right. Uh, we as the wealthy can solve our diseases of influence. You know, the heart disease is killing half the people. The cancers that are killing about half the people. We can solve that and win greatly and make the extra food available by changing from an animal food-based diet to a plant food-based diet. We can make that food available to the have-nots, the people of the world that actually are a great threat to us because they want to live like we do. You know, they watch CNN news. They want to live like Americans. Well, you know, if I feed these populations well and their children aren't starving, my safety is assured. Mm -hmm. And plus my health is assured. There's no losers in this except for a few people who, as you mentioned, Jim and Salish, are focused on consumerism, gaining more. But otherwise, everybody wins. And of course, the big winner here we want is the planet. We want planet Earth to continue to be a favorable home. And uh, anyway, Heather, what, what, what other kind of questions do we have? Do we have a time to address? So, what have we learned from the COVID experience that we can apply to climate change? Well, as I, as I mentioned, we've learned that we have the capacity to change. I mean. You know, we went from a society where that was maskless to a society where 80, 90 percent of the people were in masks. Uh, we went from a society where everybody worked to a society where, you know, good share of the population is unemployed. Uh, we went to a, from a society where you people cons consumed half their meals in restaurants to where they're all eating at home. And of course, we've seen the reflections in improvements in our environment. We went from a society where we all traveled on airplanes, every place we wanted to go, where now the airline industry I read is about off 90% of the passengers, except during holiday times. So I, I think most importantly, COVID-19 has taught us that we can change and we can survive with these changes and we can even see the benefit of these changes. Uh, you know, it's a terrible thing, so many people dying, don't get me wrong. It's a terrible thing to have people unemployed. Don't get me wrong. But there have been some very positive things. And most important to me is this is the COVID climate, which is a concept that uh, Jim Hicks introduced to me when we were at James Cameron's house. It's the COVID climate that should bring us all together as populations throughout the earth to destroy that comet, that, that comet before it destroys us. Again, you know, we don't want to be dealing with the possibility that we can change and improve things or that we should have changed our diet when Florida is under 20 feet of water. Yeah, to me, COVID has taught us that nature is going to force a change on us, whether we like it or not. And it's going to be changed in the right direction because nature is so much smarter than we think, okay? So we are better off forestalling that and doing it ourselves first so that we minimize our suffering. Because if nature does it through COVID and diseases like that, we're gonna suffer in the process of the change. I mean, she's forcing the change. She's saying, shut down the airline industry. It is getting shut down. And she's saying, oh, I'm gonna kill you if you have these comorb you know, all these comorbidities. So people are now have to eat well so that they get rid of these comorbidities. So it is, nature is going to sort this out and we want to be part of it when she sorts it out. And that's why it's important for us to transform our system, transform ourselves without waiting for nature to do it for us. Yeah, I, I wanna challenge you with the fact that uh, 
except for a few people, everybody on the planet is going to follow a vegan diet, a diet of rice, corn, and potatoes. You can do it in a pleasant way under your particular control, just like Mary and I are about to have lunch. And we're going to eat a very, uh, very delicious vegan lunch. But most, most of the population is still in a frame of mind where all they're going to have left are a few potatoes, you know, a bit of corn, a loaf of bread, because nothing else is available. You will make this dietary change. I, I have no doubt that planet Earth will go through the dietary change. But we're, we want to do it under our control, or as you say, under the, under the force of nature. The planet is going to survive. You've heard that many times. The planet will survive. The question is whether, whether the human species will survive. And, and the animals that we so much enjoy and the plants we so much enjoy, how much extinction is going to happen? You know, well, maybe it'll take a million years for us to recover, this planet to recover, but it will survive and recover with or without us. You will change your diet by your own will or by force of nature. You're going to change. Uh, and other questions people have, there's one more subject I want to address uh, before we have to quit, Heather. Um, let's see. I think those are all the ones that all right. apply to today, this morning. So, uh, uh, Dr. O, uh, one of the, uh, the theories that you talk about in, in Climate Healers and in your white paper at Climate Healers, which I encourage everybody to read, is the half-planet possibility. Could you talk to us a little bit about that, about the half planet? Yeah, this is uh, um, Edward O. Wilson had said that uh, if we return half the earth back to nature and, and give wild animals the ability to move, to migrate north to south, so that they can then find the right climate for their, for their survival as climate change happens, right? Because climate is changing, whether we like it or not, it's changing and it's going to come down, it's going to go up, it's going to, you know, it's going to wave, uh, wave it around a bit until we stabilize it and through our actions. And so for, to allow them the ability to thrive on Mother Earth, we need to give them back half the land and make sure that there is, it is contiguous from north to south so that they can migrate freely. And over that corridor, we may have to, you know, we may have to have build, build bridges so that we don't, you know, go through them with the hyperloop or whatever. <laughs> so uh, fundamentally, we have to behave in a way that we are here as caretakers of the planet. We are here to serve the animals. We, so we are here to make sure that they thrive. When they thrive, we thrive. This is what Jim, um, James Lovelock was talking about. If because of our presence, if the earth improves, then we'll be here. But because of our presence, if the earth gets degraded every time, we are going to disappear. So the current system seems to be focused on sustainable degradation, degraded in a way that people don't notice that it's being degraded until it's too late. You know, instead, we need to be honest with ourselves and see you know, how do we get to a planet that's thriving and the easiest way is to use um, E.O. Wilson's half earth theory, which is give back half the earth back to nature. And the easiest way to do that is to go on a plant-based diet, because as soon as you do that, 37% of the land area of the planet gets returned back to nature. And then we can go and you know, create food for us there for the animals and for ourselves so that we can thrive without having to do even agriculture. Well, I hope you see that there are some real possibilities out there that are are realistic and under our control. And that we need to institute these now. We can do it. We don't have all the answers. I brought together for you this morning two of the world experts on this matter of diet and climate change. But there are lots of other people out there with talent, with ideas. And hopefully we started a movement which will cause people to no longer minimize the importance of a good diet, no longer make excuses for the way they eat, like to get my protein or calcium. It doesn't do any harm. The animals don't care whether they get killed or not. No, we got to stop telling these lies. And many of you out there have information, you have skills that we would like you to bring to us 
to, to get this problem solved again so that we can have families that can have a place to live. I, I want to thank uh, Salish Raul, Dr. Raul, and Jim Hicks for their contribution this morning. Uh, if you'd like to get a hold of them, we have information on, on contact information on both of them. Both have great books and great websites. And we'll have them back again this afternoon, which I believe starts at one o'clock Pacific time. We're going to approach this thing with three other experts who have some very practical ideas about not only how we're we destroying the environment, but how we can fix it. So we had a great session this morning, Heather. I want to thank you very much. Your technical skills were perfectly adequate, but I, but I would keep your day job as the director of the McDougal program. <laughs> you do it. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I know. That was lots of fun. I, I appreciate you all being here, and hopefully uh, we have some good, good conversation and uh, much more this afternoon. So you know how to get in touch with us. This entire day will be on our YouTube channel, and uh, let's continue this conversation.